Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. <clears throat> and this is a very interesting series. We're coming close to the end of it on three cosmic messages. And you probably recognize that that comes from Revelation 14. And those are the three angels' messages from Revelation 14. This is part one in one of the final steps in that discussion on the seal of God and the mark of the beast. This is lesson number 11 for June 10 of 2023. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our wonderful Father, as we once again open the scriptures and try to understand what's written there, we thank you so much for giving us some sometimes puzzling but mostly clear messages about what we can expect it in the end days. May those messages stick with us and prepare us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are some very serious warnings given in the book of Revelation for those who will be living in the final days of this world's history. On those who make a dis conscious decision to be on God's side, he will place on their foreheads, notice that, a seal visible only to angels. At the same time, Satan is determined to place on the foreheads of as many people as he can his invisible mark. If he cannot place it on their foreheads, he will place it on their hands, a sign of being on Satan's side for convenience. Revelation 7, 2 and 3. Jim, can you read that for us? And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. He called out, in a loud voice to the four angels to whom God had given the power to, to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, do not harm the sea, excuse me, the earth, the sea, and, or the trees until the mark of the servants of, your, of our God will, me, with a seal on their foreheads. American Bible Society, 1992. Good news translation. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, if we had a lot of time, I would take you over to Ezekiel 9, the first six verses especially. You'll discover over there that a warning similar to this was given to the Jews just as Nebuchadnezzar is conquering Jerusalem for the third time and completely destroying, turning Jerusalem into a pile of rubble. So I don't know. That doesn't sound very auspicious as a, <laughs> as a preamble, does it? God's system is built on love. There is never any use of force. By contrast, we read in Revelation 13, Daniel 7, and 2 Thessalonians 2 about a certain power that usurps or tries to usurp God's authority and command loyalty and introduces a counterfeit system of worship. It does this through the use of force, coercion, and at times bribes and rewards all in order to compel worship. And that's sort of a compilation of what is in this Bible study guide. The use of force is Satan's number one weapon. He will use force in any way he possibly can. Notice these very significant words in the first few pages of Desire of Ages concerning the conditions in the world just before Christ the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. Jennifer, could you read that for us? Yes, from the writings of Ellen G. White, EGW, the earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. Malachi 4, verse 2, from Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages, page 22, paragraph 1. Okay. 
That sounds a lot like uh, your handout on love that's posted on theox.org. It certainly does. Did you get the idea from this paragraph? Partly. Yes, partly to from a large this extent. Paragraph. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I want you to notice something interesting there. God wants us to love him. And you can't force love. Satan doesn't care how we feel about him just so long as he gets his way. So he can use force as much as he wants. That's called an encratia, a, a, a democ, democrat. Demo, yeah. People control uh, or mob control. Our choice is spelled out, spelled out quite clearly. We will try to outline the two sides as carefully as possible in this discussion. So if you've ever wondered about the mark of the beast and the seal of God, let's try to get it as clear as we can. Will we choose to remain faithful to the side of Jesus Christ? Or will we choose the easy way and join Satan's side? Notice carefully the words in each of the three angels' messages. Gordon? Revelation 14, 7. He, that is the first angel, said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Good News Bible. And then verse 8. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. Okay, and then the third angel warns against the worshiping this beast. <clears throat> Want me to continue there? Yeah, go ahead. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That's from the New King James Version. We have a Good News Bible version, but I think that was understandable enough. We don't need to read it from the other version. We must always remember that in the Bible, God's wrath or anger is described very clearly. It is not what anger or wrath means in a modern dictionary. <clears throat> God's wrath is his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. God continues to try to woo them back. And you remember Romans 6.23 says what? Sin pays its, Sin wage. Pays its wage, death. death. But the re-gift of God is everlasting life. One of the clearest examples of God's wrath, which means his giving up on or leaving the object of his, his wrath, was seen at the cross. Charles, you want to read that for us? You know, Myra, I'm sorry. Okay. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness, which lasted for three hours. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud I don't say it as well as you do. I like the... Loud shout. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? That was the result of God's wrath. Uh, notice there it says, what did God do when his wrath is poured out on Jesus? Abandoned. He leaves him. He abandons him. Okay, go ahead. Some of the people standing there heard him and said, he is calling for Elijah. One of them ran up at once, took a, soak, took a sponge, soaked it in cheap wine, and put it on the end of a stick and tried to make him drink it. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. <clears throat> Why would they say he's calling for Elijah? Do you have any idea? Well, there's two reasons. One, where, did Eli where was Elijah at that point in time? Heaven. He was in heaven. They knew that the, the Bible says clearly he's already in heaven. But secondly, the very last paragraph of the Old Testament, as we have it, says what? At the end of time, a warning is going to come. Elijah will return. Mm -hmm. So they're hoping that this is a sign that, of course, their idea was that, you know, Elijah was going to help them. The Messiah was going to help them. They were going to conquer all their enemies. They were going to rule the world. So that's what they were thinking. 
But what does the sponge and the wine have to do with? Well, that's that's a thing that it, that, that has nothing to do with the Elijah thing. That has to do with it, it was a mild anesthetic, so okay. it was per, it was they permitted. He was quench his thirst. It was he was permitted. It was permitted to give people who were crucified a little bit of something to numb the pain. Okay. Um, but the others said, "Wait, let us see if Elijah is coming to save him." Jesus again gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The wrath of uh, okay. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. From Mrs. White's writings, it says, the, the wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to the fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Can I interrupt once more? Why is God angry about sin? Because it's taking his people away from him. Yeah, it damages his children. I mean, what would you do if you, you, someone comes along and starts, you know, just terribly abusing your children? Would you be happy about it? No. No? Okay, go ahead. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt, the, of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in his hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Now, I'm, I'm going to interrupt again. I want, to, I want us to try to just wrap our mind about what we just read. Jesus was so concerned about the fact that he couldn't perceive his father's presence that all his physical pain, think what he's been through already, all of his physical pain, he was hardly felt. Now, the reason I'm asking us to emphasize that, to think about that is, what do we think of when we choose to sin? Does it make us just absolutely hor horrified that we would such a thing would ever happen to us? Is it painful to us? Not to most of us. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Myra. Okay. Um, Satan. Satan, with his fierce temptation, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror or to tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation would be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was a sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. From the Mrs. White's Desire of Ages, page 753. The sense of sin, the sense of his father's abandoning him, the sense of his father's. And so why is that important to us? Well, read the next couple of paragraphs. On the cross, Jesus experienced what sinners will experience in the final judgment at the third coming. Eternal separation. Yes. Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb. He could not see the Father's reconciling face. He was afraid that their separation was to be eternal. Okay? And for the wicked at the end, will the separation be eternal? It will, it will be. be. God will finally leave sinners to reap the consequences of their choices. That will be the truth for those who are finally impenitent. At their own persistent insistence, Sinners will eventually be left by God to do and be what they insist on doing, leaving God. Okay, Charles? Will they, will they have any feeling like Christ had, though? Yeah. I mean, they don't care. Oh, yes, they will care at that point in time when they realize all of what they're missing and what, what they have given up. 
That's, yeah, that's the whole idea. They will, remember, they're going to see Christ lifted up on his throne high above the New Jerusalem, and they're going to see him crowned, and they're going to be able to see just a little bit, not a whole lot, but something of what the people inside the city are experiencing, and they're going to realize, they're going to be shouting out to the people around them, oh, why did I do this? Why did I do that? It's whatever. And uh, all of that's spelled out. Charles, but, you want they've been so persistent mm -hmm. in their choices that that even though for a moment they understand, if left to themselves, they would well, no matter what, they, they, they will they, separate from God. They would do the same again and given, again. And given again. the choice, they would do it again. Well, but even Satan kneels down, mm -hmm. uh, and and he realizes, but then suddenly he says, "No, we are." bigger group than they are. Let's go conquer. I mean, that's coming. Uh, Philippians, I think, chapter 2. Yeah, well, I mean, what he says is, the tree of life is in there. If we can just get to the tree of life, we will, we will save ourselves. I don't care how bad we might have been. We're not, that's not the question right now. All we have to do is get to the tree of life. And, of course, they won't be able to. Okay, you want to read us Matthew 27? 27, 45, 46. Reading again. Yeah. I just read it. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness, which lasted for three hours. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Goodness Bible. Jesus did not say or ask, why are you killing me? Or why are you torturing me? Instead, he asked, why did you abandon me? So now we go back again to Romans 6, 23. Who is causing the death of sinners? For sin pays its wages, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, now, it seems like given that information, everyone would choose to be on God's side, right? If you really believe what we just read, wouldn't that, shouldn't everyone decide to be on God's side? Well, no one is suggesting that remaining faithful to God's side is going to be easy. Satan doesn't want you to stay on God's side. So we're told in Revelation 14, 12, these important words, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commands and are faithful to Jesus. Now, let's, let's unpack those words a little bit, see if we can understand them a little more, de a little more detail. Jim? Gill's exp exposition of the Bible has an interesting paraphrase of that verse. From the Bible study guide, here are they that keep the commandments of God and not the inventions of men and the traditions of Antichrist, but the ordinances of the gospel, as they were at first delivered without any adulteration and corruption, and who kept them because they were enjoined by God and from the principle of love to him. And with the view to his glory, these are distinguished from the worshipers of the beast and were preserved throughout the, apost throughout the apostasy. These are the witnesses and the remnant of the women's seed with whom the dragon made war by the beast. Comments on Revelation, or, uh, Revelation 14, okay. 12. And if you get our handout, which is available on our website at theox.org, O -R -G, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You can uh, click on the link there and see uh, the more details about that, uh, par uh, that paraphrase. The following, the faithful followers of Jesus will distinguish themselves by their faith in Jesus and their faith from Jesus. Steadfast endurance is the meaning of the Greek word hupamone and it will be required of God's end-time people. We are born sinful. Our natural tendencies in this sinful world are to be done, are, are to do what comes naturally. And that means to follow the devil. <clears throat> it requires significant day-by-day -day effort to change that condition. The good news is that God is present beside us to help us every day. Jennifer, can you help us with that? 
Sure, from Miss White. It is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Wow. Great Controversy, page 555. So, how fast do we change? The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. What does that mean? Doesn't happen overnight, right? No. So ste step by step, bit by bit, we are changed. The troubles and trials we face, we face each day may seem like small matters, but we need to remember what Jesus himself said. Gordon? Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones, Luke 16, 10. So the core message of the great controversy, struggle, was spelled out by Jesus in those final hours of his life on this earth. So what example did Jesus leave us? While well, there on the cross, when everything seemed to be turning against him, we read, Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs of the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he, replied, he relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. The time he spent with yeah. God so, every night. Yeah, he's just saying, I know my Father. I know that this is not his choice. This, he is not the one that's causing this. I will trust him even if I die. And Jesus had spent nights yes. in prayer with God. Luke, Luke 6, verse 12, and sometimes entire nights in prayer with his father. He was acquainted with the character of his father, and he understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. By faith he rested in him, whom it had never been his joy to obey. Ever been. Ever been his joy. Yeah, not never. Ever been his joy to obey. And as his... As in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. So, Great Controversy 756. Let's think a moment what that means. He's saying, I don't care how I feel right now. I don't care about all the bleeding back. I don't care about the crown of thorns. I don't care about my hands out there stretched with nails through them and my feet with nails through them. Those things are awful. And this is, this is what sin does. But what matters to me, not all that, is not all that. What matters to me is my relationship to Father. And that relationship is cement solid. I don't, I'm not going to let any of this discourage me, make me feel bad, make me want to give up. I know I could, I could jump off this cross and go back to heaven straight away. I am not going to do it. Yeah, I, I remember you teaching that faith is yeah. a relationship with God. Yeah, that's absolutely. So, so that's the core message of the great controversy, relationship. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And in Romans 14, 23, after having a long discussion about what's right to do and what's not right to do, it says, Faith and sin are opposite. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Remember. So if you're moving closer to God, we call that faith. If you're moving away from God, that's sin. They're opposites. Well, he knew all along, though, when the, as we know, when the plan of salvation, um, when the thought about creating this world came up, I uh, said, well, then we have to put the plan of salvation together. So then we read in Genesis 3.15, yeah. you know, and so he knew that. He knew yeah. all of this. Even then, uh, he was Titus and other places in the New Testament tell us all of this was worked out. Jesus knew what was coming before the foundation of this world, before this world was made. 
amazing. I, I think Jennifer is the youngest one you know, among, yeah. uh, among the Adventists, so and literally also the youngest one. So. But anyways, do you, I, I, I should not ask this, but, but you see a conviction brought you to this fold. It's, it would be horrible if indeed if when you study on your own, when you go to church and uh, that that conviction does not go stronger. Sometimes uh, I sometimes wonder, so what did I hear today in the sermon, you know, kind of thing. I mean, uh, to me, I mean, I'm not, to me, I want to be reminded why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, why am I here and where am I going? Mm -hmm. That should be every yeah. day, whenever, wherever we attend the church. It yeah. should be that, that's the only thing we have. How many understand this next point? Yes. Satan was in a desperate situation back then. When Jesus came and was born as a baby boy in Bethlehem, Satan was determined to get him one way or another because Satan knew that if, if Christ succeeds in his mission, it's all over for him. So the devil had a three-step plan. One, Satan assured his associates that every person who had ever lived on this earth had sinned, and he would get Jesus to sin. Wasn't he right? Everybody who had lived on this earth had sinned? Yep. Mm -hmm. But throughout his life, including in the wilderness, Satan and his team failed to get Jesus to sin. So what do you do? You go to step two. Jesus had lived through many years of his life and even though through times of great opposition from people who claimed to be faithful followers of God. Satan, in the closing days and months of the life of Jesus, was determined to make things as difficult for Jesus as he possibly could. It was Satan's hope that Jesus would give up on this salvation trip to save humanity and would just go back to heaven. In Satan's plan, Jesus would not have to sin. He would just need to leave humanity. Well, when Jesus, finally, when Jesus was finally dead and buried in the tomb, Satan recognized he had one more possible way to succeed in the great controversy. He must keep Jesus dead in that tomb. Of course, he failed on Resurrection Sunday. The angel Gabriel and an associate came down from heaven with God's glory, rolled back the stone and called Jesus. Then Jesus came forth from the tomb in the power that he had within himself. Um, and I like to remind people that there were a hundred Roman soldiers there. And we think, wow, it was protected. This, this tomb was protected. No, I will absolutely guarantee you that every single one of Satan's and all his angels were there trying to keep that tomb shut. So when that angel, Gabriel, had, it doesn't tell what, who, what the other angel's name was, when those two angels came down, accompanied by God's glory, what happens to the wicked angels when God's glory shows up? There, there was nothing they could do. Just they, 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 they ran. So how are we going to develop that kind of faith? It will not come as a result of one great massive decision made at the last minute. The time for preparation is when? No. Now. Every little trial we face gives us a chance to choose God's side or Satan's side. The loving way or the selfish way. Romans 1, 16 and 17 and Galatians 3, 11 teach us that it is only by a personal relationship. Jennifer, there's the story about faith again. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which we call faith, that we will manage to succeed in this conflict. But it's not going to be easy. Revelation 13 makes it clear that we will face religious intolerance, economic boycott, persecution, and finally a death decree. Those things are coming, you know, presumably in the near future. Satan will work through religio-political powers on this earth, even performing miracles to convince the world to follow him. So now, let's talk about those beasts. Who are the beasts and what do the beasts represent? The clues to identifying the beast power from the sea of Revelation chapter 13 are extremely specific in this study. We will discuss three of these significant identifying marks of the beast from the sea. The first clue we find concerns the origin of its power. Now, we quote 
uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, the dragon gave him, the beast from the sea, his power, his throne, and great authority. So, who is this dragon that gives the beast from the sea of Revelation 13 his power, throne, and authority? The Satan himself. Satan. One of the, yeah, that's the beast from Revelation 12, Satan himself. Satan himself. And then looking on to Revelation 13, 3, 4, and 7, 8, what's going to be the result? One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. We don't have time to discuss that right now, but the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. The whole earth. Everyone worshipped the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. Can you imagine living in a world when everybody is worshipping the devil? Are we getting close? To it. It's, we see it, <laughs> you see it coming down the pike. Okay. Because he had given his authority to the beast. They worship the beast also, saying, who is like the beast who can fight against it? It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. And it was, and what would, what, what sense was God's, uh, was the devil able to defeat God's people? What happened during the 1260 days, which we have talked about already? They had to flee into the wilderness. They had to go into hiding. And thousands, and caves and maybe even millions of them were killed. Yep. They estimate anywhere from 60 to 100 million. Yeah. All people living on earth will worship it. That is the dragon, the devil. Except, whew, there's an exception. Those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the Book of the Living, which belongs to the Lamb, that was killed. And Gordon, I mean, not Gordon, Jim, you want to pick up that next one there? Uh, from Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. This second beast performed great miracles. It made fire come down from out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. Now let me interrupt for a second. This is not talking about that first beast that got the authority from the dragon. This is a second beast. Okay, go ahead. And it deceived all the people living on the earth by means of miracles which it was allowed to perform on the, in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The Good News Bible. Okay, we as Seventh-day Adventists have been taught that that first beast represented, represents the papacy, the Roman Catholic system. Not the Roman Catholic uh, uh, persons and people themselves, but, but, but the but, system. But wait, all the reformers, every single one, believed that the first beast was Rome. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they also identified, they said well, they knew who the second beast, they, they, knew that the second beast was not too far. This was in the yeah. early 1700s. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And now we talk about the second beast. And what is that? Let us explore in some more detail how to identify these beasts who are spoken of in Revelation 13. Jennifer? So from the Bible Study Guide, the first beast of Revelation 13 receives his power, seat, and great authority from the dragon. Revelation 12 verse 9 and the Revelation and Revelation 22 identify the dragon as Satan. Satan is a cunning foe and works through earthly powers. Revelation 12 3 through 5 says this quote dragon, the devil attempted to destroy the quote male child as soon as he was born. Okay, so clearly it's not any of us who are alive here at this, this time in history, no matter who, whether it's the Pope or anybody else, we are not the dragon. So somebody who tried to destroy the Christ child back as, just after he was born, and obviously, who's that? Satan. Has to be Satan. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. This, quote, male child was later caught up to God and his throne. This, of course, refers to Christ. Desiring to destroy the Christ child, Satan worked through Herod the Great and Imperial Rome to try to kill Jesus soon after he was born. At the end of Jesus' life, a Roman governor, Pilate, condemned Christ to die. A Roman execu executioner nailed him to the cruel cross. 
A Roman soldier pierced him with a spear, and Roman soldiers guarded his tomb. According to Revelation 13.2, the dragon, Satan, working through pagan Rome, would give the seat of its government to this emerging beast power. Hmm. The seat of his government. I wonder where that is. Mm. Notice carefully that the dragon, otherwise called the devil or Satan, or God's opponent, sometimes Satan means God's opponent, is identified in Revelation 12 as a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. This dragon was primarily responsible for one-third of the angels being cast out of heaven. So again, this can't be any human individual, can it? Okay, In Gordon? the SDA Bible commentary, it says, through primarily representing Satan, no, prim though pro pri primarily representing Satan, the dragon is a, in a secondary sense, represents the Roman Empire, the power succeeding the Roman Empire, which received from the dragon his power and his seat and great authority is clearly papal Rome. Out of the ruins of political Rome arose the great moral empire in the giant form of the Roman church. Mm -hmm. That's according to A.C. Flick in The Rise of the Medieval Church, quoted in the Bible Study Guide. Okay. Quoted in the commentary, I'm sorry. And then the Bible Study Guide, the beast of Revelation is in an apostate, is an apostate religious power that arises out of pagan Rome and grows to become a worldwide system of worship. What could that be? Yeah. According to Revelation 13, 5, it is a blasphemous power. In the New Testament, blasphemy is equated with assuming the privileges and prerogatives of God as an equal from the Bible Study Guide for Thursday. Okay, so is there a worldwide system that is claiming ability to act on God's behalf? So what is it going to take for us to stand firm through all of that? John 16, 2, Matthew 10, 22, and 1 Peter 4, 12 make it very clear that we will face all kinds of problems, including friends who will turn against us. Everyone will hate us because of our Christian beliefs. There will be no middle ground in this conflict. We will be 100% on the side of Jesus or 100% on the side of Satan. So what do we know about this apostate religious power? Try to imagine what it will be like when it is against the law to buy or sell without the devil's permission or the permission of his surrogates. And at the same time, a decree goes out that everyone who refuses to follow the devil should be killed. So now let's dig into the blasphemy idea a little bit more. What is blasphemy? Luke 5, 18 through 26, and I think, I think we have time to look at that real quickly. Luke 5, 18 to 26. Let me enlarge this so we can see it more clearly. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed, and they tried to take him into the house and put him in front of Jesus. Because of the crowd, however, they could find no way to take him in. So they carried him up on the roof, made an opening in the tiles, and let him down on his bed into the middle of the group in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw how, how much faith they had, he said to the man, Your sins are forgiven, my friend. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees began to say to themselves, Who is this man who speaks such blasphemy? God is the only one who can forgive sins. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, why do you think such things? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? Now remember that in, in their belief system in those days, sorry, in their system, their belief system in their days, every, every serious disease is a direct result of sin. So if you forgive the sin, the person will be healed. So you can't, but you can't heal the person unless you take care of the sins. So they were in a bind. So is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man, this human being here, has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. At once the man got up in front of them all, 
took the bed he had been lying on and went home, praising God. They were all completely amazed, full of fear, and praised God, and they praised God, saying, what marvelous things we have seen today. I, you know, just imagine that kind of situation. So blasphemy, our point for this discussion is what? Claiming to God. have the power to forgive sins. Okay. Uh, Jesus, of course, who had, was God, he could do such things. Another identifying mark of the false beast is that he claims to mediate between God and man and to forgive sin. We've already talked about the forgiving sin. From the Bible Study Guide. Meanwhile, 1 Timothy 2, 5 teaches that there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. In contrast, the Roman Church teaches that the priest is the mediator between God and sinful humanity. But because the priest himself is a sinful human being, he cannot be our mediator because he also needs a mediator. Blasphemy also is defined as a claim of any human to be God or to stand in the place of God. Here are just two statements from the Roman Church's authority, authoritative sources. Now, the, you know, the, the Church, the Roman Church, makes very clear, loud claims. They don't, they don't hide their claims. Look at these words. Yes. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man. He is as it were God on earth. Wow. Yeah, it's Lucius Ferris. Mm -hmm. uh, a discussion of Papa. That's the, that's this Italian word for Pope. Okay. And Pope Leo the 13th? Yeah. Boasted, we, the popes, hold on to this earth. The hold upon this earth. Hold upon this earth, the place of God Almighty. Wow. Yeah, they don't beat around the bush. They just say it out <laughs> plain. Yeah. There you have it. Two places where the Catholic Church openly declares we have, we control the authority of God on this earth. And of course we know that, you know, all the, the ordained priests of the Catholic Church b believe they have the power to forgive sins. They well, say they, that they do forgive sins, yeah. yes. And they claim that they create Jesus there yeah. with that little wafer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, host, Charles? Or whatever. Would some repeat it? Uh, where are we? Pope? Right. Bible study guide with some repeat of the Bible. Uh, right. Okay, right there, yeah. Uh, with some repeat of above, the Pope is the vicar of God. Hence, the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and the lower regions. Triple crown. The Pope is as it were God on earth, chief kings of king, king of kings, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent uh, God directions of heaven, heavenly kingdom. Uh, so Louis Ferris, Papa. Yeah, let, let's quoting him again. spell that out a little bit. So now they believe, according to this statement, that the Pope rules the heavens, he rules the earth, and he rules everything that's, you know, you, they define this in different ways, but basically the, the land of the dead. So everyone who's ever lived is under the control of the, of the Pope, according to these statements. We all believe that, right? What is vicar, the vicar of God? Oh, vicarious. Vi it means vicarious. That means someone who stands in the place of someone else. Yeah. Um, Except that he got a respiratory infection and got admitted yeah. to the hospital. <laughs> Couldn't help it. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, right. Yeah. So where is God in the Pope's, or in the Roman Catholic? Okay, well... I'm told since I was young that the Pope wears a crown, a triple crown with three round circles like this, and it says on there, Vicar in Italian, Vicarius Fili, uh, Latin actually, Vicarius Filii Dei, which means substitute for the Son of God. 
That's what that means, literally, substitute for the Son of God. And so, I mean, it was fine to be told that all the time until I traveled to Buenos Aires one time and had a chance to do some walking around there and visit one of the, one of the main downtown churches in our, our cathedrals in, in Buenos Aires. And there was a model, not a mod, I mean, it was, it was carved in stone, I think, or in metal, either metal or stone, of that triple crown, and there it is. There it was. I took a picture of it. It wasn't the Pope, it wasn't, he wasn't wearing, but there, I mean, obviously, there is their claim, right there. But that was, but, his, that was his prior church, wasn't it? Whose prior church? Prison Pope. The, the, the Pope. Right. Oh, yeah, he, the current Pope you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the current yeah. Pope. But where is God? I mean, if the Pope is standing there and saying, I'm a substitute for God, has God disappeared? No, so he's, he's, just, having, he's just doing whatever they tell him to. This one you get to see is for their... This is the visual. Yeah. Okay. The Pope of, is the boss of the earth. He's the well, this, yes, we but just he, read here he, that he's the boss of heaven and earth and, and the, and the land, land of the dead. So. Yeah, where is God? That's the question. <laughs> well, the, he's taking orders from them. That's what he's doing. Okay. So what does the Bible say about whether a man can take God's place? 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there is one God, and there is one who brings God and human beings together, the man, Jesus Christ. Hmm. One mediator, okay? Romans the Pope? What? Not the Pope. Not the Pope. Romans 13, 3 to 4 tell us that this dragon power demands worship. There's a third clue that Revelation, 14 get, uh, Revelation 13 gives us in identifying the beast from the sea, and that's blasphemy. We've talked about that a little already. As we've already seen, blasphemy is present when any being who is not God claims to have the power of God. So, so where does the Catholic Church... Uh, is there a statement from them saying against something against blasphemy? I mean, they're obviously... Against blasphemy? Well, they're obviously no, they're, acting... No, they're practicing blasphemy. Practicing. That's they're practicing true. blasphemy when they claim to be able to do the things which we know only God has ability to do. Well, and they say straight out, mm -hmm. I'm acting as... Yeah. Yeah, just straight out. They do say they're the representative of God on earth. Mm -hmm. So... So to them, to them, there is something okay. higher, but okay. you know we can't on, see that. It, mm -hmm. okay. The, the yeah. Pope is God on earth. Okay, Revelation thirteen five and six. The beast yeah. was allowed to make proud claims, which were insulting to God, and it was permitted to have authority for forty two months. It began to curse God, His name, and the place where He lives, and all those who live in heaven. Good News Bible. Okay. And John 10, 33? They replied, We do not want to stone you, Jesus, because of any good deeds, but because of your blasphemy. You are only a man, but you are trying to make yourself God. Good News Translation. And news we, this is a thing, an issue that the church has struggled with from, from the day Jesus died until this day, how could one being be fully man and fully God at the same time? And some people lean toward, well, he's completely God, but he's partly human. And others lean to, well, he's completely human and he, he's partly God. And they had, down through the ages, they've had massive conferences to try to struggle with that question. Well, Luke 5, 21. Oh, they were just massive conferences. Haven't they had massive wars also? Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, back, back when Rome was in deterioration, three, two or three of, the, three of the nations that actually conquered Rome at one point in time were Arian. What does Arian mean? They didn't believe that Christ was fully God, that he was fully man, and he was better than other people, but not fully God. Right there, one of the nations who conquered Rome. 
we may recognize that the Roman Catholic Church has done a... Uh, 521, you didn't do that. Oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, go ahead, Jim, you read that. Luke 521, the teachers of law and the Pharisees began to say to themselves, who is this man who speaks such blasphemy? God is the only one who can forgive sins. Oh, my goodness, my word. Okay. We may recognize that the Roman Catholic Church has done a lot of good down through the generations, through its schools, hospitals, and humanitarian services. However, among our questions are, are they guilty of blasphemy, or are they faithful to God? Jennifer? From the Bible Study Guide, these claims become even more relevant when we understand that the prefix anti, as an antichrist, doesn't always mean against, but also can mean in the place of. Hence, Antichrist also means in place of Christ. Talk about blasphemy. Yeah. <laughs> and then from Ellen G. White, from the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth to deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. Whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether or by rejecting one of its precepts, the result will be ultimately the same. He that offends in one point manifests contempt for the whole law. His influence and example are on the side of transgression. He becomes, quote, guilty of all, from James 2.10. In seeking to cast contempt upon the divine statutes, Satan has perverted the doctrines of the Bible, and errors have thus become incorporated into the faith of thousands who profess to believe the scriptures. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Upon this battle, we are now entering, a battle between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah, between the religion of the Bible and the religion of fable and tradition. From Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy, page 582. Okay. As we know, Jesus repeatedly identified himself in the New Testament as the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, let me just read one of the most famous passages of that, Mark 2, 28. I'm going to actually start with 27, just to get a little bit of context here. If I can get my thing to go up. 27, and Jesus concluded, the Sabbath was made for the good of human beings, and they were not made for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, this human being, what he's saying, is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's a pretty outstanding, outstanding uh, claim, isn't it? In the book of Revelation, worship is based on God's creative ability and the fact that we know that we are all children of God. The fact that he created us makes him worthy of our worship. From the Bible study guide for Friday, the Sabbath is an eternal reminder of our identity. It reminds us of who we are as human beings. It places worth on every human being. It consistently reinforces, constantly. it constantly reinforces the idea that we are created beings and that our creator is worthy of our allegiance and worship. This is the reason why the devil hates the Sabbath so much. It is the golden link that unites us with our creator. And this is why it will play such a crucial role in the final crisis at the end. Bible study guide for Friday. Okay, so what is the Sabbath <coughs> supposed to do for us? Unites us with our Creator. Unites us with God. What does Satan hate? People being united with God. <laughs> that should be pretty straightforward, right? Many, even of those who claim to be faithful, Bible-believing Christians doubt the existence of a literal Satan. How should we respond to such people? Well, Zechariah 3, Revelation 12 through 14, Isaiah 14, and Ezekiel 28 speak specifically about the behavior and the actions of this character. Myra? From the Bible Study Guide. 
Revelation is a book of contrasts. This study discusses the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Throughout the centuries, the Sabbath has been a special sign of allegiance to God. The Sabbath was revealed that God is worthy of worship as the creator of the universe. The mark of the beast also revolves around worship. Satan has introduced a counterfeit Sabbath, the first day of the week, as a symbol of his authority. The final yeah. conflict between Christ and Satan focuses on who is worthy to rule the universe. Because Jesus is the giver of life, he is worthy to be worshipped. Satan understands this truth as one of the dominant issues in the great controversy between good and evil. For this reason, Satan attacks the Sabbath, the symbol of God's creative authority. Okay, so we've just suggested this. And here we've had a statement in this from the Bible study guide that suggests that from the very beginning, from the point where Satan rebelled in heaven, he was trying to claim that he had a better way of running you know, the universe than God. And what are we seeing now? If Satan were in charge, the whole universe would fall apart and destroy itself. If we if, suppose that every individual in the entire world was just totally selfish, what would that be like? I mean, that's what Satan was like. Be pretty much close to what yeah, we are. That's pretty, yeah. that's pretty true. You don't have to be quite so, flan so <laughs> frank about it. Well, a couple people here on this side are selfish. <laughs> yeah. The Using the book of Revelation, <laughs> <laughs> Using the book of Revelation and other passages of Scripture, could you give a clear picture of who the beast is that rises out of the sea, that is, the sea beast? This beast tries to claim for itself the authority to act in the place of God. Instead, he gets his authority from the dragon, who is Satan himself. Historically, this human organization arose out of the ruins of the Roman Empire. So what do we know about how the Roman power opposed Christ from his very birth? This was pagan Rome, when, which became papal Rome. That yes. We must remember this. So all I read is pa okay, pagan Rome. We got Rome. just a few seconds left. Uh, assume you all are familiar with this. He, Jesus, they tried to kill Jesus when he was still just a baby. Pilate supervised his, his trial. A Roman execution or nailed him to the cross. A Roman soldier pierced him with his spear and so forth. So all these things that Rome did against and again, they all failed. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we've had of learning of these marks of the beast and his characteristics who help us to separate and distinguish between the good, the true, and the false. Guide us as we seek to understand your will better each day, each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.